welcome everyone. Um, it's really nice to see so many people here um, and it's so nice that we can carry on um, despite the current global situation we can still come and bring you talks and share all of our um, passion and knowledge um, and we're such a big group of people so thank you for coming uh, and hope you enjoy uh, my talk. So if you've seen any of my previous talks uh, you'll know that as Nature and Wildlife Officer I spend a lot of time um, talking about the nature that we have on our doorstep um, here in Morecambe Bay and particularly with the birds that we find out on the coast. Uh, the waders and wildfowl that we get on the shores during the winter time and the birds that we get uh, nesting on, um, on the ground uh, during the summer months. Um, however, this year um, a lot of us have been less able to get out um, and see wildlife at nature reserves or out of the coast than we would usually have, have been able to. Um, and I know that personally I've been spending a lot more time uh, than I ideally would be in urban landscapes. And I found that during lockdown, um, like a lot of other people, I spent a lot of time sat in my home office, looking out the window, um, desperately looking for some signs of life. Um, and I did notice uh, a lot more of the wildlife that we have living, not just living, but surviving and thriving uh, just outside the window um, on the, the streets and the rooftops uh, of town. So that inspired me to uh, put together a little talk um, about how I've got to know my urban wildlife a little better and some of the interesting things about some of the species that people tend to find a little bit less interesting. So hopefully you'll find it interesting too. So this is the view from my office. Um, not a lot of green or garden to look at, um, but actually there is quite a lot of wildlife to see and there's definitely a lot of things going on, particularly through the, the spring and the summer, but also now in the winter time, there's plenty of activity and plenty of birds around. Um, and it's really rewarding, uh, even though it's not anything rare or unusual, um, to watch the lives of the birds unfolding um, on the, the doorsteps and the rooftops of town. So um, I want to share with you all the things I've discovered uh, about urban wildlife and give you some tips about where to look um, when you're looking, looking for wildlife in what um, people seem to like calling the urban jungle. So this is just the content of the talk. Um, First, I'll introduce you to some of the species that you commonly see in the towns and cities and give you a bit more detail on things that you might not know about them and why they're full of character. Um, and I'll also uh, talk a little bit about um, a couple of species that can be a little bit more elusive. So it is mainly birds because birds are the most obvious things that we get in towns and cities, uh, but there are a couple of non feathery creatures in there as well. Uh, and to introduce some of the species, I'll talk a bit about uh, why the animals that have made their um, homes in towns and cities, um, why, why that's what they've decided to do um, and what features these built up areas have in common um, with the animals is more natural environment. And also why it might be beneficial for animals to move in alongside us rather than stay in the countryside. And then finally, I'll give you a few tips to where to find wildlife when you're in a city. So hopefully, hopefully that sounds good. Um, the first species that um, I'd like to introduce through the talk is um, a species that probably everyone in probably everyone in the world could have a stab at identifying. Um, and that would be the humble pigeon. Um, so despite being found all around the world and despite the fact that they've been living alongside alongside humans since about 3000 BC, they really don't have a very glamorous reputation. But pigeons are in fact very um, underrated, I think, uh, animals. They're um, incredible navigators. Um, they've long been recognized as incredible navigators, um, being used as homing pigeons to send messages across the country but recently we've been starting to understand how they manage to navigate such long distances. And we think that as well as things like using the position of the sun uh, and an internal compass, they also use uh, sort of urban landmarks in order to find the way. And Oxford University have even found that pigeons use our roads and motorways to navigate. And not only this, but they'll change directions at the junctions on our roads, instead of going what would be a quicker way across the fields, uh, they'll come off at, at certain junctions and that'll help them find the way. So the great navigators. 
they're also um been they've also been shown to be very intelligent uh so over the years they've been subject to a wide range of intelligence tests and they've got some surprising results uh, they're one of very few species that can recognize themselves in a mirror and not only that they can also recognize letters of the alphabet um, and furthermore a study, a study in 1995 showed that with some training pigeons were able to tell apart cubist paintings from impressionist paintings so they understood that when they pecked at a Picasso painting they would get rewarded at food and then um, if they pecked if they pecked at a Monet painting they wouldn't get rewarded with food and they managed to do this even when um, presented with paintings they'd never seen before they could still tell um, what sort of painting it was. Uh, so the great navigators they're really smart but they're also um, really sociable so you see big groups of them um, and it turns out that they've got quite well-defined social structures in their communities. So in a standard pigeon group you've got two characters You've got your producers who go around and find food and then you've got your scroungers who follow the producers around and pick up all the food um, that the producers find. Uh, it's been shown that there's typically a lot more scroungers than producers in pigeon society um, but it's not been shown yet how many scroungers um, one producer can support so maybe that's a project for the future to see how um, pigeon society works. So as I say, um, pigeons have lived alongside people for millennia, with the first recordings stretching back as far as 3000 BC. Um, and people would keep uh, these birds, uh, which are stock doves, as pets, or they keep them for food, or they keep them to carry messages. So city pigeons or feral pigeons are closely related to rock doves. And it's thought that the influx of feral pigeons to our, our um, cities are the result of escaped or lost domesticated uh, rock doves um, who have replaced their natural cliff habitat with man-made buildings perfect for nesting and saving predators. So your main difference between a rock dove uh, which you find in cliffs and your feral pigeon which you find in cities is uh, their plumage. So rock doves have um, really quite nice grey and black striped uh, wings whereas a pigeon if we just go back to the last slide they, they can look like anything they've got all sorts of different patterns going on so um because of pigeons ability to breed all year round um and because of the masses of food that's available to them in a city there are quite a lot of them and they do like to gather together in town centers uh, where they find the best food and shelter so this is sort of where they get a bad reputation. They're quite seen as quite annoying and quite mangy to have around. Um, but in nothing else, there is one benefit to having pigeons um, in our towns. And that is that they bring in uh, what some people would call slightly more exciting um, visitors to our cities. And that is birds of prey. So this is a peregrine falcon. Uh, they are the fastest birds in the world and they're capable of reaching speeds of uh, 200 miles an hour. Peregrine falcons that you get in cities are generally powered by pigeons. So in recent years, they've uh, relocated to our cities. They've been taking advantage of tall skyscrapers for nesting areas and also taking advantage of the plentiful pigeon populations uh, for sustenance. So last year, uh, they were found nesting on the condemned uh, Thwaites Brewery Tower in Blackburn. Fortunately, the pair was spotted um, by a bird watcher before um, the tower was demolished. And thanks to them pointing it out and alerting the demolition company, uh, the demolition of the building was actually postponed so that the chicks, the peregrine family, could finish raising their young and get them to fledging stage before the tower was knocked down. So it's a happy story. The birds managed to fledge successfully and then the, the tower was pulled down a few, a few months later. Uh, whilst we're talking about urban predators, um, there's none quite as notorious as the urban seagull. So anyone who lives in Barrow in particular will know um, quite how annoying seagulls can be. Um, they're definitely a staple of our towns, uh, especially in places around Morecambe Bay where we're positioned quite close to the sea. Um, and like pigeons, as I say, seagulls have a less than favourable reputation amongst 
quite a lot of people, but most from people who live alongside them in the towns. And a big part of the reason why they don't have the best reputation is because uh, they have a bit of a habit of uh, working in pairs to mug unsuspecting individuals of their ice creams, of their sausage rolls, or of the sandwich. Don't know if anyone um, has experienced this themselves. I certainly have. Uh, it's quite surprising and not what you expect. Um, but this stealing of food from other species um, has a special scientific name uh, called kleptoparasitism. And it might make you feel better if you just had your pasty stolen to know that people aren't the only victim of kleptoparasitism. Uh, gulls will routinely mug other bird species of their hard, hard found dinner um, and take it for themselves. So not the most uh, charismatic um, habit of the herring gull. However, despite that, they are quite impressive birds. So there's three types of gull that you'll commonly see in towns. Um, this one over on the right is the black headed gull. Uh, so these are quite a bit smaller than the other two. They um, are quite noisy and but they're a good bit less aggressive and you'll see them hanging out in big groups um, by waterways like canals and rivers and um, often looking for scraps. They're more than happy to take the rest of your um, your chip dinner that you leave on the park bench. Uh, the other two, uh, the bigger gulls, uh, we have the herring gull, which has the um, sort of light grey uh, wing feathers, and the lesser black white gull, which has the, the dark grey feathers. And these are the ones that you might have had a, a less than enjoyable um, experience with if you encountered them at the seaside. Um, if you have come across them, you'll know that they're quite formidable birds. They're really big. I was even surprised to learn that herring gulls can have a wingspan of up to 1.5 meters, which is about five foot, which is only a little bit shorter than I am. Um, so they're really big, but they're also really intelligent and they can work together as a team uh, to pinch someone's pasty. Uh, they can solve problems and it's also been shown that they can even remember what time to visit the school playground to take advantage of break times for supplementary food uh, from children sort of spilling their lunch on the floor. Even more impressive than that, that there's footage of seagulls actively um, activating automatic doors to pop into Tesco or other shops um, and steal crisps straight off the shelves. So you could say that they've really made themselves at home in the cities, possibly a little bit more than we'd like them to. The other thing that people uh, tend to know and dislike about seagulls is how vocal they are. So um, lots of squawking, lots of running around, but all this squawking and squabbling isn't random. Gulls have a really highly developed communication system and they can convey messages to other gulls and even other species to either scare off competitors, protect chicks, or tell their friends about a bounty of food that they found. So, there's a little bit more to goals than you might give them credit for. Um, finally, in the sort of common uh, city birds that you have, uh, you have starlings. So much less uh, aggressive than um, herring gulls. But I mean, if you're a smaller bird, you might find them quite boisterous. So starlings are um, quite small, dark passerines that you find in towns and cities. Um, from a distance, they sort of they look just quite like a small brown bird. But as you can see in these pictures, um, when they catch the light, they have these beautiful petrol colored feathers with little um, white patches on their breast. Um, so I think, I think they're really beautiful birds. They, um, they do live in the UK all year round, but you might have noticed recently um, in the winter time, uh, the numbers go up quite significantly. And this is when migrant flocks join existing populations um, for the winter. So one of the great things about, about this influx of uh, migrating birds, uh, migrating starlings in the winter time, is that in the winter we get these incredible murmurations um, that the starlings perform around dusk. So if you've ever seen a murmuration, you'll know that 
millions and well thousands and even millions of birds can come together to form basically a swarm that acts as like a single entity and it will swoop and twist around the sky as it gets dark. We're not entirely sure why they do this um, but it's thought that it helps them to avoid predators as they start um, going down into the trees to roost and it also helps them bond as a community um, and share information uh, that they've gathered during the day. So in the towns and cities around the bay, uh, you might not get the same numbers that you do uh, for murmurations, uh, for example, over the reed beds at Leighton Moss. Um, but if you do look up at dust, you're likely to see little smaller subgroups doing practice flights um, as they make their way to the bigger roost to join in the main, um, the main dance. So starlings like towns and cities because uh, buildings make ideal roosting spots and the playing fields and open markets um, in towns also make great um, foraging grounds. So like gulls, they do also make quite a lot of noise. But interestingly, um, starlings tend to make the noises of the things around them. So this mimicry in the city um, might mean that the sounds that the starlings make sound more like car horns or reversing vehicles um, and they just blend into the city noise. So doing some research I found various uh, tales of starlings impersonating everything from ringtones to children crying to lorry reversing sounds. So they've really got quite an impressive um, vocabulary for such a, a small, small brown bird. So good places to see uh, flocks of starlings in Morecambe Bay uh, include Lancaster and Barrow and the biggest urban murmurations uh, can be seen just a little bit south of the bay uh, down in Blackpool and this time of year is as I say the best time to see them. So from murmurations at dusk uh, we move into uh, nighttime in the city. So most mammals that you get in the city are creatures of the darkness, uh, creatures of the night. So once the hustle and bustle um, of the daytime draws to an end and all of us people start to turn in for the night, that's when the wild animals start to come out and reclaim the streets. And the most iconic of uh, city wildlife, I guess, is uh, the red fox. So foxes are found all over the country, uh, from countrysides to cities, and some individuals um, even span both habitats and will venture all the way across the country, um, checking out the best places for food and food and hiding places, I guess. Uh, one fox uh, was fitted with a GPS tracker in 2014 um, and it managed to travel 195 miles in just three weeks right across the country. We're not sure where he was going or what he was doing, um, but what it does suggest is that unlike things like seagulls who have distinct urban and rural populations, uh, foxes probably move freely between their country homes and their city dwellings. They, um, they love cities because uh, basically they're scavengers. Um, they're opportunistic feeders like a lot of city wildlife and they can make use of a large range of food sources. They also have a sort of cat-like agility um, if anyone's seen a fox running around, you know it, they don't. They sort of they act more like cats than dogs, even though they're more closely related to dogs. And this means that they can climb, explore, squeeze into small gaps, and that way access pretty much anywhere in the city. Um, one fox uh, in 2011 also even decided to make his home right up on the 72nd floor of the shard when it was under construction. Uh, feeding on the scraps left behind by, um, by the workmen who were busy building the tower. It got rescued safely and then set free once it got back down to ground level and seemed nonplussed about the situation. So like seagulls and pigeons, uh, foxes don't always get the best press, possibly due to their noisy uh, screeching and their rummaging through bins but it's likely that um, healthy fox populations do benefit us um, and help to naturally control things like rats who carry diseases that are harmful to people. So love them or hate them, they love being um, in our towns and cities. 
And I don't know if anyone um, has ever had the experience of walking, either being up early in the morning or coming home late at night and just coming face to face with a fox um, in a town. Um, and you've got to admit, whether you love foxes or hate foxes, it's quite an experience to come face to face with um, wildlife um, at night time in that way. So it would be, I think, a little bit amiss of me to be talking about birds and not to mention uh, the lovely coastal birds that we have here in Morgan Bay. So whilst wading birds aren't particularly known for living alongside us in towns, apart from Morecambe, where there's fantastic roots right, right by the town, um, waders have been increasingly shown to adapt to more industrial settings or urban settings in recent years. So this picture is from a man-made roost at Heusham Ferry Port. And it's honestly one of the best places in Morecambe Bay to go to see waders, vast numbers of oyster catchers and not taking refuge on the sort of inaccessible seawall um, during the high tide keeps them nice and safe from disturbance. As um, I've mentioned quite a lot in my previous talks, waders are generally negatively affected by um, increased human presence um, in their feeding, roosting or breeding habitat. Um, frequent disturbance by people or dogs uh, forces them to use up to 12 times more energy to escape um, the perceived threat or the actual threat of people or dogs being nearby. And then that costs them valuable feeding time. So the combination of the loss of feeding time and the increased energy use results in the birds not having enough energy to survive. So you'd think they want to stay away from people, but there are some examples um, where waders have found a benefit in seeking out more urban or industrialised areas. So this is a red shank. Uh, red shank are sort of lovely medium sized red legged waders. Um, you might see them perched on the sea defences at Morecambe or lurking around in the salt marshes perhaps. And they've recently been shown to have a preference for industrial um, estuary sites, such as the Mersey estuary and the Forth estuary, uh, places surrounded by industrial complexes and houses um, and pouring out lots and lots of light pollution. But this, still to be, this seems to be attracting even more waders. So red shank are usually visual predators, so they rely on daylight in order to get enough to eat to spot um, the little invertebrates in the mud in April and which helps them catch them. Um, however, in the winter, obviously daylight comes a premium um, and some days the red shank uh, might not get a chance if there's a high spring tide during the day to get down to the best feeding grounds lower on the beach. They can forage at night, um, just probing and sweeping at random through the mud, but this isn't as, if, um, as efficient as using the right eye as well. So what the researchers have found is that the artificial light at industrial sites allows the red shank to feed in the most efficient way using its eyes, um, but also doing this at night. So it can use the light pollution to help it see while it forages. And this allows the red shank to top up its energy reserves um, and build back the fat that it might have lost whilst waiting for the tide to go out or avoiding an inquisitive dog so they're using this man-made light uh, pollution uh, really to their, to their advantage. Uh, turnstones have also been taking advantage of human beings colonizing their habitats. Uh, so turnstones are generalist feeders like foxes and seagulls and pigeons. Uh, they can eat a whole manner of different things. Unlike most waders, as I say, who tend to avoid being close to people at all costs, certain populations of turnstones have decided to start foraging amongst the black-headed gulls and the pigeons uh, at seaside towns uh, for the discarded chips that people like to feed to them. So clearly these waders have done some little bit of cost benefit analysis of the benefits of um, getting close to people and managing to get enough to eat. So by ri risking this proximity to human beings, they're able to get more food that must outweigh the danger of uh, being too close to people. 
And finally, for our adaptable urban waders, we have, um, I think, Welcome Bay Partnership's favourite, the oyster catcher. Uh, so whilst oyster catchers are a common sight on our beaches um, here in Morecambe Bay during the winter months, during the summer, they start to spread a little bit further afield to lay their eggs and raise chicks. Some of the oyster catchers do stay and nest on our rocky shores or our salt marshes. Some of them move to farmland areas to nest on uh, sort of grazing fields. But there are an enterprising few who relocate to towns and cities um, and nest in a whole manner of strange places uh, like gravel car parks, uh, flat roofs, uh, and even large flower pots. Why is it? So other waders don't do this, and it's only oyster catchers that can. And this is because oyster catchers, unlike other waders, uh, feed their young by bringing them food, whereas other waders' chicks are independent quite quickly and feed themselves. So this means that chicks can be safely contained, safe on a high roof, um, or take advantage of the lack of predators in human dominated areas like car parks, whilst mum and dad go and forage for worms on nearby playing fields or roundabouts or gardens. So whilst this might seem like a good idea, that chicks are really safe from predators, um, there are other certain risks to them uh, nesting in these urban environments. Um, drawbacks include uh, risk of dehydration, um, accidental falls off roofs, um, or accidental nest destruction if they nest too close to where people are walking. So there's a Dutch citizen science project um, which is trying to work out if it's a good thing that the oyster catchers have started moving into our towns and cities or if they might be losing out by taking this risk and moving in a little bit close to us. So why do all of these species choose to live alongside such loud and bright neighbours as us humans? Well, there are a few reasons. Um, towns and cities have lots of buildings and buildings are very similar to cliffs. So many of the birds uh, we have in our cities would previously have nested on cliffs. So your pigeons, seagulls, uh, peregrines, um, they've all evolved to nest on cliff ledges. So it's unsurprising that our tall towns also fit the bill to raise um, as a place to raise their young. Secondly, there's lots of food for um, a hungry bird in cities. So I'm sure many of us um, here are aware of how much food humans produce uh, and also how much of it goes to waste. So not only do we discard the bones, the peels, uh, the past, their sell by date items of food, um, which hungry wildlife are only too happy to take care of for, for us. Um, but we also actively feed the wildlife in our towns and cities at places like duck ponds, bird feeders, um, or at park benches. So the rewards for bolder creatures that can navigate the hazards of traffic and overhead cables, and sometimes frustrated tourists, is an endless stream of food with minimal effort to find it. And the third reason that they choose towns and cities as a place to live is that um, they offer more protection from predators. So predators that animals face in the wild tend to stay clear of urban environments. Uh, there's fewer birds of prey um, and mammalian predators such as stoats and weasels. Even foxes, which you do get in the cities, are far more wary and reserved in the city than they would be in the countryside. And they're less likely to venture up a high sky rise building um, in order to plunder a nest when there's plenty of food around the bins for them to find. So I think the wildlife um, living in our cities, they've sort of decided to cling to us and follow us where we live um, because of the protection that we have. A little bit like remora fish that um, live their lives attached to great white sharks. They're protected by the bigger animal and they're only too happy to pick up the scraps. So they've found an unlikely sanctuary amongst the most dangerous predator of them all, which is us. Um, as well as this, it's been found that individuals, uh, individual species living in cities tend to develop bigger brain sizes. And this is due to com the complexity and the stimulation of the area compared to 
a natural environment. So there may also be an evolutionary benefit to moving to the city for more intrepid individuals in wildlife. So where do you look when you're looking for wildlife in, in a town or in a city? The first place, just look up. Um, as I mentioned, trees and buildings in town centres or cities can all harbour homes for wildlife, but it's also worth just looking up at the sky and seeing if there's anything looking at you from up above. Um, I quite regularly see kestrels around the town I live in. Um, and, you know, if you look up at dusk, you might well see a group of um, starlings on the way to join the main murmurations. Um, and, you know, things like white-tailed eagles have even been spotted this year over London. So it's really worth just taking a moment and having a little look up and see if there's anything above you. Uh, green spaces are a great place to find wildlife. Um, they can act as pit stops for tired or hungry birds. Um, Football pitches contain plenty of worms for birds to eat. Uh, churchyards can provide a quiet corner with lots of trees with lots of berries or pine cones in them for birds to forage in or even squirrels to forage in. Um, and parks offer both natural food like insects and seeds um, as well as crumbs from picnics that people might leave behind. And finally, uh, waterways. Uh, like rivers, canals and ponds in towns are a really good place to see wildlife. So over recent years, um, urban rivers and canals have really sort of cleaned up their act um, and it's been reflected in the increased wildlife sightings are seen in them. So if you go for a walk along Lancaster Canal, you'd be doing well if you didn't manage to catch um, a glimpse of a, a heron. Um, and maybe if you're walking around along the Austin Canal, you might see the blue flash of a kingfisher, um, both of those hunting for the fish uh, just beneath the water. And even otters. So a few weeks ago, I saw on Twitter an incredible video of a pair of otters in broad daylight um, squabbling over a huge salmon. And it was just filmed from the middle of um, Kendall Town Centre in broad daylight. So they're definitely making a move back, um, back into our towns and cities, which is fantastic to see. So that would be the number one place to look for wildlife, I'd say, along the, along the waterways. So that brings me almost to the end of my talk. Um, I feel a little bit like I have once again decided to tackle a subject that is slightly too vast and interesting to fit into a, a 45 minute talk. Um, but hopefully I've given you a taste for discovering more about urban wildlife and um, perhaps you can go and see what you can see uh, next time you're in town. I do just have one more thing to say before um, I can answer some questions. Um, so lately on our social media, um, on our newsletters and on our various platforms, you might have noticed that we've been asking people to stop, look and listen for wildlife before heading down to the shore. So the primary function of this campaign is to ask people to check for wildlife before letting dogs off the lead or before running down to the shore and scaring off some uh, resting or vulnerable birds. However, I do think that there is um, a second way to look at this messaging and that is to whenever you're out and about, just take a moment to stop, look and listen and see if you can see any wildlife while you're out and about. So, you know, if, you, um, if you're at my last talk, you'll know that I, I like to give people who attend the talks a little challenge um, before I let them go. Um, so this time, I just want to challenge everyone, uh, whether you're at a nature reserve or whether you're waiting at the bus, waiting for the bus, or if you're stuck in traffic or in the middle of a forest, just take a few minutes to stop, look, and listen for wildlife and just see what you can see. So you might see a pigeon that followed the same motorway as you to get into town, um, or you might see a seagull that's waiting for the end of the school day so it can finish off foraging um, in the playground. And you know, you might be surprised at what you can discover. So Next time you're in town, Christmas shopping or nipping to the post office to post Christmas cards, just 
um, just take, take a minute to see what you can see. And hopefully um, you'll find it as inspiring as I have over the last few months. So that's everything. Um, we're on all the social media. So if you'd like to learn more about wildlife around Morecambe Bay, I do recommend uh, give us a follow. That was terrific, Amy. Thank you so much. Gosh, what a lot you've covered and uh, so, many <laughs> so many ideas, so many thoughts. Thank you. I'm sure there's lots of people who have uh, themselves encountered whole varieties of um, wildlife. I think most of us, as you say, will have seen foxes. I think new for everybody may be the, now then, I don't know if I dare even try to pronounce it, klepto Parasitism. What a great <laughs> I like the idea of someone's uh, someone's friend getting an ice cream taken off them and then just saying to them, Oh, you've just been klepto kleptoparasitized there. <laughs> I think that might cause a bit of upset. That's a, <laughs> absolutely terrific and a terrific word. If there are questions, everybody's very welcome to put them in the chat or I don't know, Amy, if you want to stop screen sharing now we can okay. come back to um, seeing people and if people do have questions maybe we could uh, bring those up. I had one whilst we were waiting for some further questions to come in around bird flu and whether you think bird flu is going to affect our um, our native birds this this winter. Yeah I'm not sure I mean um, obviously I mean here in Orverston the swans have been quite badly affected um, so I guess it depends how how resilient they are to it it feels like the humans have just had their plague um yeah. that was just sort of just about coming to the end of and now the poor birds are getting it so it's not it's not great but you know fingers crossed there's enough diversity i think in the birds that we have here that you know at least some of them should be able to fight it off we often hear of swans getting it are they particularly prone i think I think because uh, the same families of swans tend to stay in the same areas, so on the same canals, um, they probably don't have as much genetic diversity as, you know, wild birds do. They don't travel as far as, you know, like a starling might. Um, so they've got less diversity and they're not as resilient to um, the viruses that come around. Oh. And when did you last see a, a kingfisher in town in town um well i've seen them along the canal um i think in kendall town you'd, you'd see them wherever there's a river they just need little perches to sit on so it could be a little branch sticking out of the water or it could be a, a trolley that's half submerged they just need something to perch on and as long as there's fish in the water then then they'll be there um but it can be like looking for a needle in a haystack looking for kingfishers mm. <laughs> you've got to let them come to you i think <laughs> So did I see, Rich, did you have a question for us? Would you like to unmute and ask it yourself? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> um, I want to just ask a little bit about uh, research on birds and I'll just illustrate it with uh, a little bit of a story, a true story. <clears throat> it's about the neighbouring area, Boland to Morecambe Bay and uh, of course Boland is uh, just as good an area as Morecambe, isn't it? But we, no, <laughs> we can talk about that. But the um, the uh, emblem for Boland is the hen harrier, which is very, very powerless as to whether it's going to continue and exist or not. But there's some research which has been done very recently, and um, it turns out that the females from lots of different parts of England and even Scotland, in the winter, cluster together in relatively lowland areas, unfortunately not to the west of uh, Boland, which is Morecambe Bay, but over in uh, the eastern part of England. And whilst the males shoot off flying all around Europe, doing all sorts of daft things flying all, all around Europe. Now, the serious part of my question is that um, the females, where they spend some months relatively close together in the lowland areas towards the east of England, are actually in areas where they can get predated. Uh, so one of the questions that we asked of DEFRA as a Lancashire Local Access Forum, um, you know, maybe 12 months ago, was um, are you considering designating some of these lowland areas which now house female hen harriers as SPAs, Special Protection Areas? 
And the answer was, I was delighted, but the answer was, yes, we are starting to consider that. Oh, so the reason I'm pausing that, although it's not quite uh, more convey at the moment, you know, it's a neighbouring area, is there is a lot still to be found out about birds, even mm. though we might see very, 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 very familiar ones. You've been talking about ones that perhaps we all know about and see. Actually, there's a huge amount still to be discovered and found out about. Um, and, you know, we had a delightful... Uh, um, presentation last time about uh, the Dormouse, but I just wonder if there is any active research on birds in and around the Morecambe Bay area, which in turn may lead to them, uh, you know, being protected or looked after or has been able to do different things than we do at the moment. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure that there is a great deal of research going on um, around the Morecambe Bay area, but it's definitely something that should happen. Um, I know a great deal of research on particularly the waders comes from the ringing efforts. Um, and unfortunately, it's quite a, a small number of people who do the ringing and who know to look out for the colour rings to report them. But the amount of data that you can get about, you know, both individual birds and whole populations from that is, is fantastic. So I think, mm. you know, in the future, it'd be good to see um, our local universities doing a bit more research on um, on the ringing work and um, mm. we did have plans to do some of it this year but unfortunately due to covid we've had to postpone it a bit so mm. um hopefully in the new year we'll be trying to get um at least a couple new people uh starting to train as um bird ringers and starting to build a bit more research about the, the birds that we have um around the coast in Morgan bay but i totally agree with you there's so much about birds that we don't know that is a complete mystery um I mean, my favourite thing is that, you know, you know, the phrase, someone's got a bird brain, they're not very smart. And then, you know, as time goes on, we're just finding out that birds are so incredibly intelligent and they can do wow. their brains work in completely different ways to how our brains work. And it's just the tip of the iceberg, really, you know, pigeons being able to decipher between different artists. Mm. What, what else can they do? Mm. Right. I mean, I think I always think um, <clears throat> actually one of the best things we can always do with anything like this is, you know, the old mantra, education, 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 isn't it? So, I mean, I know that Morgan Bay, you've just, you've just shown it on uh, a couple of the posters. One of the best things we can do is actually educate as many people, whether they're young people or older people, about all these sorts of things to do with our natural world that, you know, we live with. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Richard, yeah. That's, that's what we're doing, <laughs> what we're trying yeah. to do. And Amy's really passionate about that and, and a terrific yeah. Yeah. Uh, ad, ambassador, really, for the Birds of the Bay. I, I noticed, Steve, and Steve King, you were asking about photos. Do you want to ask your question? Do you have any particular photos you want to share? Yeah, hi, hi everyone, and hi, Amy and, and Susanna. Um, yeah, <clears throat> that question was prompted because I got quite a nice photo of a heron on my garage uh, <laughs> Fantastic. two weeks ago. Um, so I thought, oh, I wonder if anybody else has had interesting photos that perhaps they'd like to send in if there's a way of kind of showing them if, if people want to. <coughs> Dis amazing discoveries. Uh, along yeah, definitely. Yeah. Areas. Send us, send us your, your photos of wildlife that you've seen, you know, in and around your, your homes. That would be great to have. We'll, um, we'll have to put them together into a Facebook post or something or share them. Um, it'd be great to see what everyone else is looking at out the windows while we're all trapped yeah, indoors. Absolutely. Thank you. No, that's lovely. And, and the heron is, I think they're very mysterious birds. I always think they... Um, they, they have a sort of mystery to them, don't they? There's something very slightly ominous about them, but equally very uh, entrancing. I don't know, am I the only person who has all this sort of personal folklore about birds, or do other people build up their own personal folklores around birds that they see? No, well, I, I did I've have heard. one other experience. Uh, a falcon of some um, breed, um, or yeah. I'm not quite sure what they, the right word is there, did once land on my head <laughs> and got very scared. This was not in the UK. I was living in Ankara in Turkey at the time in a block of flats. Wow. And they were on the, on the roof of all the flats, about six or seven stories high, looking down, looking for rats. And I, I must admit, I did have longer hair at the time. So <laughs> I must have thought from above, I looked like a rat. 
don't know who was more scared, me or it. That must have hurt. <laughs> yeah. So, there we go. Fantastic. Amazing. Amazing. There was a question from Sue. I'm looking, is Sue, is Sue with us asking about disturbance? Sue, would you like to ask yes. that question yourself? Hello. Hi. I can't see you. Do you want to turn your video oh, on? Yeah, I can turn the video on. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, um, since kind of the jet skis and things were banned a number of years ago on Windermere, we've had them down on the Loon Estuary quite a lot. And yeah, it's noisy, it's disturbing for the birds, but it generally only comes at high tide. Um, but there was a new phenomenon on Sunday, and that was six, um, I can only describe them as personal hovercrafts. So there were hovercrafts with one individual on, six of them came down at once. I believe from Twitter, they'd also been round the coast at Presol and everything. They came down at low tide when the birds were either on the edge of the water or on the sand. And, you know, it's the same issue as dogs and people, but these were deafening and they were up on the sand. They went right the way down the estuary as far as up, uh, sorry, up the river as far as Snatchums, stayed up there and then came back again. Um, and I just wondered, is that legal for a start? And um, is there anything that can be done about it? Um... So I don't think it is legal. Um, I think that sort of activity on the SPA or the SSSI, um is not allowed. Um, but obviously it's quite difficult to stop someone um, out on, yeah. on watercraft. Um, so the only thing we can do is either, you know, if we know where they're coming from, is try and get contact details. If we can catch them as they're, they're leaving or as, as they're coming back. Um, but also, you know, contact the people who are supplying the hovercrafts and make sure they're aware that they can't just do it wherever they like. Um, that, you know, a lot of the Loon Estuary is a, you know, internationally protected area. Um, yeah, and they yeah. shouldn't be, they shouldn't be riding personal hovercrafts, which I've never encountered before, um, <laughs> up and down. Um, but I think it, it's people, people don't know. Um, and maybe even the people who are supplying the, the crafts don't know that they're not supposed to be doing it. Um, so we're working with Natural England to try and get um, some better um, sort of legislation and action to stop this happening. Okay. Yeah. Is video there helpful? Is, I've got it, video that I can like share on Twitter or something. Mm -hmm. um, if I kind of tag you or whatever the word is in it, the, the, RSPC, uh, the RSPB sorry, picked up on it as well. Um, and they've said that they will look into it, but I've not heard anything since. It was only on Sunday, so... Yeah. Um, but, yeah. One of, one, of, one of the issues, um, when the National Park had the great difficulty, it took them a long time to get the speed limit on Windermere, uh, then, you know, one of the trite answers was, well, they don't need to go on Windermere, they can go to the coast. Mm -hmm. So, the, you know, there was an issue there with just transferring a problem from one place to another but it was very very explicitly said that and uh, you, anybody who was involved knew it was a massive battle by the uh, uh, Lake District National Park authorities to get that uh, speed limit on uh, Windermere but they were simply told well they've got they can go to the coast they've got a big area of water on, along the coast and they can do what mm. they want to uh, these people yeah. so you know it's a difficult set of issues really but I think we have to be very alert to it and see if we can um, you know, we, we, we've got to take a balanced view of all of these things, of course, because we can't exclude everybody from doing everything. Um, but where there is any evidence that um, maybe, you know, the sort of thing that Sue's talking about is uh, disadvantageous and having an impact, I think we ought to move on it sooner rather than later. It's something that Amy has been working incredibly hard on. There is a, a recreational di disturbance group mm. that brings together the local authorities and, and many of the key stakeholders. Um, one of the things, Sue, that is helpful is if you have any um, any images or any details of uh, number plates, if you see people yes. launching, that's one of the most useful things. If they're craft where you can actually see some kind of registration number, that can also be helpful. There is a wildlife 
crime section to the police force and if you speak to your local police force they should be able to put you in touch with the wildlife crime experts and of course because the bay is multiply designated for its international numbers of birds and because the um, the wading birds are so vulnerable at high tide roosts in the winter it is a, a it is a form of crime in that they are uh, disturbing what is uh, internationally designated. So collecting evidence is something that if you are able to do it without feeling that you're putting yourself in any danger or, or at risk of um, coming into conflict, then it can be very, very worthwhile. I think probably I would rather encourage a softly, softly approach in that if you put it out on Twitter, then you, you can be a little bit in danger of escalating. So if you could share it with, um, with Amy and with Natural mm. England, then they might be able to take things forward. There is a hovercraft club of Great Britain and we have in the past have had some, some very, very positive contacts and I still do have a contact there. So there are some ways that we can move forward. And the vast majority of people as ever will want to behave responsibly and it's sometimes a lack of knowledge a lack of information that mm. makes people not behave responsibly there can always be an element of um the one percent that's always going to be the hardest uh, to reach um the classic people who who really um have yet to have their discretion informed <laughs> yeah. <laughs> very complicated way of saying yeah. <laughs> what I'm sure you're all understanding. Um, Thank you. I think that. Sue, I would I would really encourage you to to follow up those those lines, and indeed anybody else who is concerned about disturbance of uh, roosting birds, collect the evidence, share the evidence with Wildlife Crime and or with Natural England or Amy. Um, it probably wouldn't encourage you to to tackle people. Uh, too directly unless you yes. feel that you're um, very very well equipped to do so sort of a softly softly uh, approach but if there is significant disturbance and if there are number plates that can be collected that really is the best way forward because then you've got absolute mechanism to get back in time. Thank you very much yeah thanks for your help on that. I saw there were one or two other questions um, Rob you had come up with a few observations. I don't know, Rob, if you'd like to share some of them. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I found the button. Um, yeah, the, um, the observation about the oyster catchers on the, the golf course was quite fun because uh, they were always in the same place and they always got very vocal just when we were like on one hole and teeing off on the next one. And then you never heard them again. So that was quite cute. Um, yeah, they'll let you know if they're you're upsetting them, the oyster oh, catchers. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're noisy enough anyway, aren't they? Um, the one question I've got that really intrigues me about, well, about animals in general, but birds in particular, is um, I suppose I have a bit of a theory that they do things just because they enjoy them, uh, not because they're looking for food or trying to attract a mate or protect their nest or anything like that. And uh, give you a well, I think it's an interesting example of behaviour. Uh, back in the day when you used to go skiing in the Austrian Alps, you get quite high up and you'd get uh, ravens and alpine chuffs, both of which are birds which are capable of flying upside down. Not for any particular length of time. They kind of flip over and fly a bit and then flip back again. And I say that, that's, I used to say that to people when I was skiing and they were like, no, you're making that up. It doesn't happen. <laughs> You've got to look up there, just look. Yeah, I've seen that um, up on uh, Coniston Old Man. It's fantastic when they do it. They do just literally just flip onto the backs. And I, uh, I somehow ended up speaking to a raven expert one time and I asked him about it. And I, he was like, let's just do it for fun. It's just, yeah. just showing off to each other, I think. It's, and I think with animals um, and birds, like, the more intelligent they are then the more they seem to like engage in fun and um, we all know about like chimps and dolphins playing with each other um and just doing things just for the enjoyment of it um and obviously like i think i think it's not too crazy to suggest that birds do it too um yeah i think corvids are thought to be among the most more intelligent birds aren't they yeah like, especially gorgeous. ravens yeah Okay, that was my question. So thank you for the answer. Good question. 
do we have any other questions that people would like to ask or any other observations people would like to share? I'm just checking. Do, 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 you get, do you get a lot of um, visitors into the Morecambe Bay area specifically for the bird life? I think, I think so, I think probably. Um, Leighton Moss certainly gets a lot of visitors mm. um, and it's but I, I imagine they would spill out. It's not the only place in the in Morecambe Bay, far from it, to see uh, to see the birds. So, yeah, I'd say we get a lot of visitors. It's, it's a bit tricky with bird watchers because they don't they're not um, they're not sort of vocal and um, like as other visitors as maybe you know someone doing uh, for example hovercraft who might be taking loads of pictures and like reporting it a lot. Um, so bird watchers, it's harder to tell how many are coming to the area, but. I don't see why they wouldn't. Um, there's fantastic places all around the coast. Uh, Forest of Boland uh, is not too far away. Um, and especially during the summertime, there's some fantastic places to see uh, turns um, around the bay. So I'd, I'd say a lot of them come. Mm. I came <laughs> for the birds. <laughs> where, where, where I live, just below where I live, I'm quite a long way from Morecambe Bay, but we've got a, a country park and um, there's a number of people who are <coughs> photographers, amateur photographers, and they have a web page and they post absolutely phenomenal pictures every single day um, on, on that web, uh, web, web page of the, the, the bird life in and around. So there's some, um, uh, you know, tremendous resource, as it were, and opportunities uh, uh, by people who've got all sorts of niche specialist interests. But nowadays, because of IT, um, you know, we're, we're actually able to literally capture that, pictures and things like that, and capture people's interests. So, I mean, I know that you're very good at that in Morecambe Bay area, but we, we need to try to harness all of those sorts of uh, groups and interest, interested people, don't we? And try to, uh, you know, um, do the right thing, as it were, if, if I can say that. Mm, definitely. Absolutely. Do we have any, any further questions or anybody who wants to share, share one of their personal memories or special stories of wildlife, urban wildlife in particular. Amy suggested that we were all dirty stopouts and that we'd all been <laughs> stopping out late and encountering urban foxes. I, was, I said early morning, Susanna. I know you're out <laughs> early in the morning out for your runs. <laughs> yeah, I certainly, when I lived in Edinburgh, I did see uh, urban foxes when I was in my student life, yes, I do remember. It was quite a common thing to see them. And of course, up in Edinburgh in, in the summer, hardly seemed to go dark in, uh, in summertime. Yeah. But I, ha I have to say that I've uh, seen very few urban foxes uh, here. When I lived in London, uh -huh. um, that, there were hundreds mm. of them in our mm. area. And uh, in the days before wheelie bins, uh, when you took your rubbish out, they, yeah. Uh, then then to come around the next day and if you looked out of your window about hmm, one o'clock in the morning there'd be a fox at every bag <laughs> all the way down the street um, yeah, they don't don't do I can't say I've either. seen any I've hardly seen any foxes at all in the whole area maybe I've been looking in the wrong places where is it you live Tina uh, in Morecambe yeah yeah I think part of the thing is that foxes have become very adaptable there are some birds that are in danger of uh, really on a knife edge you know, like the curlews that you know we, we would only wish that they would adapt better to safer nesting sites and so forth whereas foxes have uh, really been incredibly adaptable it would be wonderful if some other birds that we love were equally flexible in their approach and not so specialist in what they want um, um, really encourage you all to, to, to join us again in the few days before Christmas for our special Christmas storytelling talk from Emily Hennessy, who is a, a local lady who has written a very special story about Morecambe Bay. So Excellent. once again, thank you all very, very much. Uh, Claire, bless you, you've just put in the chat the link for all of the recordings. So once again, a huge thank you to Amy uh, for tonight's talk. Huge thank you to you all for joining us again this evening and we so look forward to seeing you all again
before Christmas and then especially after Christmas where we're going back to the theme of some of the heritage of Morecambe Bay and that should be really really exciting. If I don't see you before our warmest wishes for a lovely Christmas and here's to a really much better year in 2021. A brighter future shines. <laughs>